All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I am Noah, and this is Steve, and we're from Capital One. We're going to be talking about a uh, large micro front end microservices application we built in the past couple of years and are operating at scale at, at Capital One. So this is going to be a, a journey where we're going to take you from what originally was a monolith to a micro everything architecture. We're going to talk then about some of the implementation details around this and then some choices and learnings we've made along the way. So who are we? Um, I'm Noah. I'm a distinguished engineer at Capital One. I've been there since 2012. This is me with my dog, Princess, and I love architecture and technical teamwork. Uh, my name is Steve Usak, and I am getting a lot of feedback. Um, I'm also a distinguished engineer at Capital One. Been there since 2014. Um, currently an architect in our commercial banking space. Um, and yeah, we're going to continue with our journey here. And this is me and my dog, Cosmo. One of the things you're going to notice about this presentation is that there are a lot of dogs. Second time we've done this presentation. The first time, uh, in an attempt to appeal to our audience, we use cats. We're going to do dogs this time. Uh, we're inclusive for all animals. Uh, we have a lot of dogs at Capital One. We have a Slack channel. All these dogs are taken from that particular Slack channel. So go back about 15 years ago. Let me tell you a little bit about the business context that we have. Uh, that business context, oops, getting a little bit of feedback. The business context is that at Capital One, uh, we have about 100 million credit card accounts. We're one of the largest credit card issuers in the United States. And customers occasionally want to talk to us. And when they have a problem, they're going to go ahead and give us a call. This application is what our agents use when that call lands to help a customer with anything from a fraud situation to making a payment to travel notification, any sort of complex situation where you want to interact with the human. Now, originally, about 15 years ago, we had a, um, we had a, is when the mic's on? Yep, okay. We had a, uh, our system was outsourced to a third party, and we decided that we could build that system better and more quickly. And so what we did is we went ahead and rewrote it using uh, ASP.NET, web forms, and C-sharp. Just about everything was server-side uh, at that time. And it was a good replacement for the original system. It did more than what we previously got in the third-party system. Uh, however, we soon ran into some issues with this monolith. Uh, one of the things about it is that we're running it on legacy infrastructure. And with that legacy infrastructure, what we would find is that there'd always be one or two servers that would function somewhat differently than the other 98. And that could be a problem, because an agent is trying to deal with a customer in some sort of standard way, and they would get some different behavior. We tried to figure it out. Turned out there was some sort of configuration drift. Uh, our build test cycle was also pretty slow. Uh, so what it would take is a developer would have to pull down six or seven million lines of code. They'd begin to do their coding. It would take a long time to debug, take a long time to write unit tests and functional tests and so forth. Builds took a full day, at least initially. So we'd have individuals who would actually create these builds. If something happened along the way, then they'd have to start over again. And testing took days. We had a very fragile test suite of about 7,000 regression tests. And when those tests fail, you'd have to start over. So we got into this very slow, large batch delivery. So once or twice a month, we would go ahead and do releases that have hundreds of changes in it, committed by hundreds of developers. And it would be very difficult to back out these changes. Sometimes we would even go multiple months without releases. Along with this, of course, with the, large, uh, with the monolith, you'd have a large failure blast radius. So if you had a problem in some obscure part of the application and bring in a whole server, agent would have to say, excuse me for one second, put the customer on hold, clear their browser clash, clear their cookies, and log back in. We also had a lot of uh, direct connections. Even beyond this, uh, besides the fact it was a monolith and difficult to work with, with millions of lines of code, uh, Capital One, like a lot of large businesses, internally operates as a lot of very small businesses. And so you might have the fraud group who would want to do a release once a month, early in the month. You'd have the small business bank that want to do a release in the latter part of the month. How do you negotiate those things? Well, you would talk a lot. There'd be a lot of friction. 
and the people who ultimately were suffering were our agents or our customers in terms of slow delivery. We wanted to be able to move faster. Uh, fortunately, in the 2010s, a lot of new thinking caught our eyes, and I'm, you've heard about this in some of these talks as well. 2010 Continuous Delivery Book was published by Farley and Humble. This really influenced our thinking around automation. 2012, Capital One embraced an API imperative similar to what Amazon had done about 10 years previously. And this began to think us thinking about, hey, we didn't necessarily have monolithic direct connections. We could have this kind of layer abstraction behind our code. 2013, another thing began to influence us was distributed systems. Uh, Capital One began its AWS cloud journey at that point. Uh, we finished in 2020, we're 100% in AWS. And then 2014 and 2015, we began to look at uh, single page applications, Steve and myself and some other developers, uh, and we realized we could get a more responsive uh, agent experience which was important to us. The, the server-side application was all uh, centered in a few geographic locations. We have agents that are all around the world, and we wanted to give them something more responsive. We also got really excited about Node.js, the idea of isomorphic JavaScript, and the ability to have our developers not have to have the context switch, switching around uh, moving from, say, a Java on the back end to JavaScript on the front end. And then the thing that really kind of gets to the heart of uh, what we're doing here is 2016 uh, with Ka Cam Jackson and his articles about micro front ends. We realized that micro front ends were probably going to be our way to work because that's the way we were working. Being able to divide up our domains into nice clean models versus kind of in the monolith where we had object-oriented objects that modeled the domains but were frequently leaky abstractions to have uh, clean contracts between different parts of our front end that hid implementation details, be able to isolate failure and decentralize as much as possible, and release independently. These were all big things for us because we had increased pressure to bring more value to the market. Uh, we wanted it all like this little guy. We wanted quick delivery, we wanted clean lines of ownership, we wanted the limited blast radius, we also wanted those simpler, smaller code bases. We'll talk about that in a minute. And room for our software engineers to iterate incrementally. So we didn't want to have to upgrade one giant app with millions of lines of code at once. We want to be able to upgrade slowly and one piece at a time. To say we knew what we were doing would be absolutely incorrect. So we have hundreds of great engineers whose work our, we stand on their shoulders of, but we failed a lot. We had to pivot five times at least. And at the same time we were doing all this, we had to go ahead and maintain that legacy application. Uh, and then our product managers, they're really nice people, but they weren't gonna do this for free. They wanted business process improvements at the same time we were changing the technology. So first thing we learned was a couple things about generally operating these sorts of platforms. You got to have a CI CD pipeline. And we have a CI CD pipeline now. We really have hundreds of these things that are based on the standard template. And you can go from PR to production with one approval, uh, including change orders, very, very valuable. The second thing when you're dealing with micro front ends, there's a big fear and a concern that maybe you'll have a different look and feel between your micro front ends. You really need to settle on a single unifying design system, a set of web components that developers can reuse that everybody agrees upon to get rid of kind of that arbitrary uniqueness. Uh, something else that we learned very uh, through hard uh, work and rough knocks was that you need to really be transparent about the way you share information, the way you collaborate, even in a very decentralized environment. So uh, Rachel was talking earlier about communication and documentation. We have a ton of documentation. We also meet once a week in what's called Tech Congress with our developers. And everybody comes in and they share what's going well, what's not going well, what sort of improvements they suggest. And we have them inner source changes into our overall framework and our libraries. That way the, uh, the rising tide raises all boats. Final thing we learned is you've got to measure your developer experience as well as your end user experience. So we uh, survey our developers every quarter and take those results and then act on what comes out of those results. So where do we sit today? Uh, we have reduced time to market with no outages 
In uh, February 2022, we delivered 12 times a day, and we had over 40 teams contributing concurrently at once. Uh, we had no, really, we didn't have any outages rela related to any of the changes. Uh, this system is highly decomposed. Uh, we have more than 100 micro front ends and a similar number of kind of micro services in the back end that help to uh, serve as back ends for front ends for these micro front ends. We can usually resolve bugs that used to take us weeks to resolve in hours, 100% cloud native. And for all of this, I think one of the things we're most proud of is our developer experience. There are other groups at Capital One who run similar platforms. Their surveys show um, that our developers like working with our system about twice as much as they like working with their system. So we're really happy about that. Uh, for the remainder of this, about implementation details, I'll turn it over to Steve. All right, thanks, Noah. Um, so how, how do we achieve this? So the first thing is we have an app shell and we use um, a multi-level routing uh, uh, component here. Um, you can see on the left hand of the slide, we use some of the major libraries here that, that are sponsored by the OpenJS Foundation, um, including Fastify, Pino, um, and others. Uh, we have dependency, uh, I'm sorry, development dependencies like Jest and then Mocha, Shinan, Chai. So on the right-hand side, you can see the, high, the highest level architecture of our system. We have um, our call center agents, who is our Capital One user, logs into our application shell. Uh, the shell basically controls your authentication and some basic parameters, but also serves as the main router and composition engine for the rest of the micro front ends. Um, you can see here that we have two LOB business applications. Uh, one happens to be in Vue, one happens to be in React. They can interact on the screen at the same time. Everything talks through a reverse proxy. This reverse proxy allows us to get uh, around some cores issues. Um, it also uh, provides a, a way for us to host these applications in ways that make sense for them to be hosted. And I'll get to that in a second. And then behind the reverse proxy, we have what we call our back ends for front ends, or orchestration layers, or middle tier, whatever you want to call them. And these are the actual business logic that informs the UI and pr helps the UI uh, present the data it needs. And as Noah mentioned, Capital One went all in on RESTful APIs a while back, and this sits on top of that. But that's not to say these have to talk to RESTful APIs, just so happens in this case, we mainly do talk to RESTful APIs, but you can imagine database access happens here and other things like that. Um, so in addition to that, we also route by convention, and this helps our router um, know what to do, essentially. So we have uh, different components of our routing. The first is our tenant. So tenant allows us to have different, uh, different applications, completely different applications running on the same shell. Um, so, and I'll get to that in a second. But then we get to the domain. Domain is just a convenience factor that allows us to segment and see in the URL kind of where you're at. But then we get down to the actual important things. And container, um, while it's Docker containers are our um, uh, deployment uh, component, it's also what we consider the, our wrapped um, uh, course grading functionality. So this will include both your uh, back end for front end service as well as your front end assets. And we serve it out of the same container um, so that we avoid any versioning issues with um, uh, trying to deploy a front end to somewhere else and a back end to somewhere else and you know something going wrong in that sense. And then down further in the URL, you have your app. Um, a can container can contain one or more micro front ends or micro UIs as it says here. And then obviously you have the resources of the application itself. Um, the configuration based page composition allows us to keep things flexible and this is where that tenant concept comes into play. So here we're showing an example of a servicing application at the top with the blue arrows and the bottom is called a quality application with the green arrows. And for our page composition, which is represented on the right, you can see that the servicing application has decided to use most of the components on the web page. And these are just simple div outlets that our router knows how to swap in and out. And the quality one here only chose to implement two of them. Um, so it allows each application to maintain its own look and feel across the system. So the end result is a cohesive application in the browser. 
Um, here you will see that we have four different applications all running at one time in the browser. Um, and then the shell is the thing bringing it all together, so essentially five applications. Um, and each one of these can be in a different um, framework. They can uh, use different backends. They can be hosted independently of each other and separately in whatever technology you wish to deploy to. Um, so getting to that, you can see that same application here on the left. Um, since we're all in on AWS, I'm going to use the AWS example here, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have to be AWS. We have that reverse proxy that I mentioned, and that allows us to host different components of the page in different fashions that make sense for them. So here you can see the shell being hosted in ECS. You see the header and footer in EKS, and then various other technologies hosting other parts of the page. Um, so it really depends on what the uh, development team needs and for their particular use case for hosting. So now we'll get into some of the lessons we've learned along the way. And this is probably why we've iterated so much on this as well. Um, so the, the very first lesson, and Noah mentioned this, is providing a, a really good developer experience. So if you recall, the monolith was ASP.NET. It was IIS. It was Windows. I love Windows, always have. Uh, always holds a special place in my heart. However, IS reset was the most common command I think our developers used when they were developing in the monolith. Um, so now, the, the way we restructured it, obviously we're not using Windows or .NET anymore. With Node, developers uh, have exactly what they need locally on their, their machine. They don't need to bring down the entire application. Noah mentioned there were hundreds of micro front ends with hundreds of services. We're not spinning up hundreds on a machine. We're spinning up only the ones they need. And we have a developer proxy that brings it all together locally. So you can imagine that that developer proxy is pointing to things that might be deployed in the cloud already and in our QA environment. And then um, the developer only has what they're working on locally. And using native node processes and Webpack dev servers, we're able to use the hot, load re re hot module reload functionality and things like that to make the development experience quick and easy. And then um, documentation. This is one of our, our, our key things that we, are, we really try to keep up to date and keep it well maintained along the way. Um, Noah also mentioned that we, we, use a, a, we, we wanted to reduce context switching with our developers' um, experience. So we use full stack JavaScript in um, the front end as well as the back or the middle tier, those orchestration layers. And um, sticking to that one language has reduced that context switch that the developers experience. Um, code testing and testing patterns, uh, we can share these now between our front end and back, or front end and middle tiers where appropriate. And um, the interesting thing is, so far, no team has opted to use a different language in their middle tier than they use on the front end. Um, an interesting fact here is this dog is a JavaScript programmer. Um, his dad uh, is one of our developers at Capital One using JavaScript all the time. Um, the most controversial thing I think we, we did early in our uh, journey was deciding on monorepo versus a polyrepo approach. Um, we landed on poly, that's the spoiler alert, and the reason we did is because Capital One being a large enterprise, we are subject, I don't know if we're subject to it, but we obey Conway's law, which states that your software is built in the way your organization is uh, organized. For what that's worth, um, when we started at a mono repo way with this this platform, our developers and our, our and uh, other people were concerned about ownership, um, seeing other people's code, worrying about vulnerabilities in that code affecting their code, and just basically not understanding how a mono repo could be put together easily. Um, so we went with polyrepo, and we actually found this to be a benefit for us in the end uh, because it does give us um, a lot more of that independent deployability without worrying about accidentally deploying somebody else. Um, the modularity, this absolutely makes it so that teams aren't you know, pulling in something inadvertently across a directory structure in, in a, re a monorepo and provided the clear lines of ownership um, for our system. So. It may not be the right answer for everybody, but it was the right answer for the system we're talking about. In my current role, 
we do use a mono repo. So it, it, we're, we're still Capital One, and we're still happy to work with each other, but um, it's just uh, how it worked out for the two different divisions. Um, another lesson is defining our support model. Um, we had to make sure everybody was on board with uh, knowing that uh, we were going to be iterating fast and producing components that were smaller and could be delivered much faster. And so they had to remain relatively secure, obviously, and as bug-free as possible to deliver the business intent that we wanted to deliver. So uh, as part of this, um, we have trusted contributors that dedicate time to our new libraries and features, which are shared amongst all the teams. And that also goes along with our comprehensive documentation and our security patching. So uh, the, the, the entire federation of developers uh, benefits from all the core work of, the, of all the contributors on the platform. We also employ an N minus one versioning uh, strategy where consuming teams are asked to stay current with the dependencies. And this is probably our, one of our biggest challenges with our, with our developers is um, maintaining those dependencies and keeping them up to date all the time and dealing with the security vulnerabilities we, we all experience. And then lastly, never stop refactoring. So um, I think we've heard a, a, a theme through some of the talks today with uh, everyone in that you know the specs are always evolving. Everything's always evolving. Nothing's ever done. We've realized we're never done either, and we've had to educate our product uh, partners that we're not done. We're not going to take tech debt. We're actually going to be proactively refactoring along the way to the, the, the N minus one latest and greatest. Um, so for example, uh, we started in Restify. Restify at that time was, was a good selection for us. We based it off the Netflix flame graph article, if you've ever seen that a couple years ago. And we thought Dtrace is going to be our, our way to figure out what's going on in prod. I can tell you right now, we never looked at a, a flame graph or anything with Restify. So um, we've moved, we're moving right now to Fastify, and we're already seeing major benefits with that. And some of the major benefits we're seeing are uh, we, automatic performance improvements. Uh, the modularity of Fastify has given us um, great ways to plug in different functionality as needed for each application. And the developer experience, again, is much better. Um, and so the important thing here is to make sure your product partners understand that this is, this is part of the process. And it, you know, sometimes you're going to have to move to a new version of Jest or a new version of Fastify, um, that sort of thing. So our journey is not unique, but obviously the path we took was, like Noah said, it took us three to five iterations to get to where we are today. Um, so we've achieved what we've needed for this platform currently. Uh, but there's more work to be done. So we are now looking at this platform in a different way of, of making it available to all of our uh, Capital One developers versus just a, a handful of um, uh, applications within. So that, that's our journey there. And like Noah said, we, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of many. So we're just here representing what we have so far. So thank you. Were there any questions? Yes. So we have the capability of doing full stack testing. There's a couple things that we do to kind of mitigate. So first thing is that um, our design partners and our product people are pretty tightly integrated, so they'll work together to, to test uh, holistically on the app. The second thing, which we did not mention in this talk, is we're heavy users of feature flags. And so what we typically do is our first release is going to be probably less than five product people. And so the application goes out, there's a good opportunity for them to test. We then scale up incrementally over time until we reach the full population. So we have found that, yes, we could do full regression testing, but that feature flag approach combined with kind of tight partnership between our design and product and tech have not forced, we don't have to do it much. Yeah, and I would add to that that um, we do use Cypress as, as our main uh, functional testing and integration testing layer. And every PR goes into a region that has the entire application in it that runs those tests. So 
you're not hopefully going to break anyone else. Our, our thing is always, uh, as everybody can write to window, the window object. And if you do that, you're a bad developer. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, however, uh, the, in general, the system's pretty resilient to failure. It, like in that application example I had of four components on the screen, if one fails to load, you get just a tiny 404 error message in that area. Not, it doesn't affect the rest of the app. Yeah, I mean, that's part of that Cypress, Cypress testing. And then uh, in general, when we go out to production, you usually have um, people on the call who are going to, or that th are going to be checking it. Um, they are not directly. So in certain cases, they do. So we've abstracted that. They use a, uh, we, in this instance, we use a Redux pattern where everything writes to a, a local store and then they react on the local store. That local store is very high level data. It never contains things like, um, in our examples, customer name or an account number. Um, it contains reference IDs that then each micro front end can listen for a change on and go query their back ends to go get you know, the, the customer name for their display. In addition, they do route through our main shell router and they can pass query string parameters to another micro front end. Like for example, if I know I'm on um, a payment page and I need to go to the rewards page at a specific point, um, you can pass in enough parameters that the rewards micro app, if those parameters are present, will go to that view. Otherwise it would default to its normal view. Adam. Adam. Yeah, so to, to repeat the question, why do we, why do we typically f favor flexibility in terms of the, the stacks that we looked at? So we're flexible and we're not. So what we do is when we, when we talk to teams, right? Like for example, we have different teams who are using this technology. We tell them, hey, you, you can choose to use React and Vue together, but what we would recommend you do is go ahead and choose one or the other. Right. What we tried to build with towards an eye, towards teams could iterate their way and slowly make changes. But generally our recommendations are gonna be, yeah, choose a UI design system. For example, there's multiple UI design systems that are official capital ones, choose one. Choose React or Vue. Uh, we, we're working on Angular. Uh, nobody's chosen to use Angular, but there are some teams that occasionally ask about it. Um, but what we're really trying to do is get away from kind of the, the battleship quality that we had with the monolith, right? Like if we wanted to, up, you know, we wanted to be able to say, you know, if we want to go from view, to, view two to view three, we'll do it in, you know, one, one basic micro front end, see what happens, right? So it, does, that make, does that help answer the question? And, and why did we choose it that way? Um, because again, we, we've seen ourselves this is probably the third or fourth call center system that we put together, and they've all kind of died in a lot of ways in the, those operational concerns where you don't have that flexibility to make changes. Eventually, the operational overhead becomes so heavy and the maintenance becomes so heavy as the technology gets older and older and it's harder to upgrade uh, that you end up just rewriting the whole thing, and that's something we were trying to avoid. Yeah, I, I would add to that. We went, um, we used to be Angular, and then um, Angular just provided too many issues for us going forward. So when we, one of those iterations, we were like, we gotta make it so we can move out of a framework easily into another one. So that's a lot of why we have that flexibility. However, we govern that flexibility. As an enterprise, we have to be a little stringent. So each application built on the platform, like Noah says, usually sticks to a standard stack. One other thing I would add on that is that we try not to be coercive in terms of kind of the general lines of people who are using these technologies. Um, 
we want them to, to opt into a, a set of decisions. But once they decide, make that decision, then we, we build or we encourage them to build artifacts that'll make it everybody else who's moving to that particular system, make it easy for them to opt into the, the, the designated choices. So rather than using a stick, we try to use a carrot a little bit more. Did I see another? I saw it. I mean, I would say, um, if it's not Angular, um, I pick on Angular. My, my division's all Angular, which is funny. But um, it's, it's not hard, because our router, all we can, all, I guess if you bundle it, we can host it. And as long as the bundle is compatible with our router, which means it has an, inter, an initialization and a cleanup. And that just allows us to call your initialization endpoint. And these are all partial HTMLs. They're not a full-blown index HTML. They're partial, so they're a div. So as long as we can uh, know what events that, that are being registered and things that you're using internally, and we can unregister right. them on the way out, we're pretty compatible. I would say bringing in, re we started with Vue for the, for the main application. And as we became more flexible, we brought on React. And React was, it was super simple. I'd yeah, say a couple, uh, probably a month. A month, yeah. right. It, because, I mean, it, it's simple. And then something we didn't have time to talk about in this talk is that, for example, this communication through this Redux store, right, is kind of at the whole app level. But for micro apps, what we allow them to do is stand up their own stores. So if you yeah. want to use Vuex, if you want to use Redux, and have these subsequent stores to operate your own little piece of the app, that's cool. We don't get in that business. Yeah, I'm sorry. And I did want to say all of our core libraries are plain old JavaScript. Uh, so they're not framework specific. They're all framework agnostic. So to use the store in uh, React and Vue, you can hook it up through NGR, not NGR, uh, whatever React uses. I'm not a front-end developer. But, or in Vue through Vuex. And once you hook it up, it works natively to your chosen framework at that point. Uh, the underlying technology of Redux is still there, and the shell, the shell just knows how to talk to it straight through Redux. So a couple other questions? Yeah, you had a question? Do you guys use model summary or model summary? We're starting to look into that uh, so that we can be, uh, we're looking into Webpack module federation actually right now um, so that we can be more supportive of our Angular uh, partners at Capital One. No iframes are, are present in this entire thing. No, you go that way. So in this particular case, this, this is a tough question because we, what we do is we are trading, to the flexibility question, we are trading off flexibility and independence for bundle size. So we know that what you're going to lose is the ability of like in a spa to do a full tree shake, right? And what we keep on doing is keep on working on, well, how can we compress? or how can we use lighter libraries? So we do incur a cost there, uh, which we're fully aware of. So far, it hasn't impacted our customers enough to, to be an issue, but it is always lurking in the background, to be fair. And, and, it's no, just, like, to be clear, like, like, for example, when they were talking about Solid today, which I've not worked with, I said, ah, this is close to vanilla JavaScript. I'm writing it down because we're going to run back and try that out, right? Because again, maybe that gets us to a smaller bundle size or gets us a better performance. Go ahead. And, and to be fair, we do have call centers in the Philippines and they're being served out of AWS East. So yes, there is latency, but we, we've, we've used um, a lot of caching 
HTTP caching is all over the place from the reverse proxy. So once things are in the reverse proxy are there, you know, then they get to the browser with the right caching headers. And so it's the first client hit that takes the hit and the first time you bring down the app and then anytime we're doing a deployment. Uh, the only things we don't cache is that um, HTML page that has the hash keys in it essentially. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, I, I would say about the kind of the micro front end ecosystem, there's a lot of kind of, there's a, there's a lot of uh, liveliness in it, right? So there's server side rendering, there's other things going on. Um, so definitely keep your eye on the ecosystem because it, it's a continually changing emerging area. Yes. Yeah, yes. so we have um, two layers for that in this instance. The first layer is just our normal authentication into the application itself, and that's handled through the shell. And then each orchestration layer has its own server-side auth to talk to anything else, and we pass the logged-in user's auth along with the server auth to do additional entitlements and other checking in down-source systems. Um, the, Trade-off there is if I need a whole different identity provider, I have to have a whole new copy of the shell and bring up a whole new shell, essentially. Uh, that is one of our roadmap items, though, is to get it out of the shell. Uh, in the back, and then we'll come back here. So there is, so in terms of our stuff, we published a blog post on it in Capital One. Uh, in terms of getting this open source, that's something we're continuing to work on. In terms of micro friends, I'd actually start with Cam Jackson's original, original article on the Martin Fowler site. And then there's a, a couple presentations or books I can look up for you afterwards. Is one about micro front end architecture that I think is pretty good. Um, and then, You'll see, you'll, you will see quite a number of Medium posts as well about it um, of, of varying quality, right, like anything else on Medium. Yeah, that book you mentioned. Uh, I cannot remember the name of it right now. Uh, I can tweet it out afterwards, or if you just come by, uh, I'll, I'll pull it up for you. Uh, you had a question as well? Um, for, for the basic container, like I mentioned that container structure, it has basically, in, it maps to a repo with two directories. One is called UI and one is called uh, API. API. <laughs> and the API is your, your back end for front end and it usually services all the UI applications and that's the only difference. And then we just use, you know, package uh, NPM or Yarn to, to run the builds through there. Um, so yeah, that it's, it's I like to call them mini mono repos <laughs> because it, it, it's essentially what they are, but they're segmented by their functionality and their business domain versus um, a mono repo of the entire application. Our micro front ends talk to their orchestration layers. Those, those orchestration layers will span out to whoever they need to talk to to get their data. They never cross talk with one another. So one micro front ends back end will never talk to another micro front ends uh, or middle tier, I'm sorry, orchestration layer, will never talk directly to each other, but they'll talk through an intermediary first. And that intermediary is um, an API exchange. So I don't know if that answers yeah. your question directly. So like with the footer, I've never talked to command point service. No. So does like no, it's... footer have like an internal admin footer versus like an API or public facing? Um, for this application everything's internal, so it's there's really no distinction between a public or a private there. Um, 
we are looking at patterns for the for the um, external versus internal case right now yeah. as I speak. <laughs> yeah, and that book is called Building Micro Front Ends. It's by uh, Luca uh, Mazzalira. And that, that's pretty useful in terms of a high level view of what's going on with micro front ends. Anything else? Thank you, it's been great to speak to you.